So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this, this opportunity to talk about things that are really important, the perspective of what it means to be yoked with you, because Father, you love us more than our sin, and you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus, you, you came, you took our sin, you went to the cross, and you gave your blood and your body and paid the price for our sin, took the wrath of the Father upon yourself so that we would, we would never have to experience that. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day and you rose from the dead and you defeated the power of sin and death in lives. You made us born again, children of the living God. Our names written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. So Lord, today we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us, Lord, as we read your word, study your word, so that we can think about you, Lord Jesus. We can eat and drink the living word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you have to make decisions in your life. You have to make decisions every day. And those decisions affect where you're going to be at any given moment. They're going to affect what you're going to think, what you're going to say. You know, be careful you think it, but be careful when you say it, right? So you got all these things. Then you're going to be thinking and you're going to, if you're, I mean, if you have any intelligence at all, and you've been around at all, have any experience, you're going to want what? You're going to want wisdom, okay? And wisdom is really, really the critical ingredient to functioning effectively and successfully in this world. Book of Proverbs makes it very clear as you go through there how critical wisdom is. And it's really important that if you were to have your, your a young son to, uh, to study something, wants to get the gospel in Jesus Christ, and you want him to study the Proverbs, you know, that's a, that's a really wonderful thing. And you study the Proverbs because we need to know how to live our lives, how to make our decisions. And one of the biggest problems we have is priorities and how we think about life. Where should we be and why should we be there? Because we have to make sacrifices and to live the life for Christ, as it says in uh, Romans 12, one through three, and to get the will of God and to understand what God wants you to do, you have to give your life as a sacrifice. You have to say, okay, my life belongs to Christ. My body belongs to Christ. I belong to Christ because when I do that, when I say that, and I begin to make decisions based on that understanding then God gives me his good and perfect will. Then I begin to learn what his will is. I begin to learn what's right. And when that happens, guess what happens to all those things that seem so out of control? Well, God ends up being the one you trust him to be in control of all the things you don't understand, all the things that are happening. So that you can say, no, it's my wife's birthday, man. I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to, you know, take her to Santa Barbara. We got that plan. And now if the deal was a real deal, now, and listen carefully. This is what I learned a long time ago. If the guy who's flying in from Connecticut thinks it's a real deal and you're, per, and you're important and it's actually going to be a deal that's going to happen, he'll say, you know, I could come next week. You know, out of the blue, he'll just say something like that. And he'll say, so no problem. I'll meet with so-and-so and we'll work it out. And all of a sudden, you realize that if you just trust God, he's sovereign. And he's got it covered. So God is the one you trust. God is the one you listen to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So today, I want to read this in uh, the first chapter of James. I want you to think about this for a minute, because James cuts through everything. I mean, really cuts through. He cuts it right to the, to the bone. And when you read this, and when you read James, and especially this first chapter, this will really touch you as to your priorities and how you think about life, okay? So let's read it. Here we go. Uh, book of James, chapter 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, of many kinds, <laughs> of many kinds of trials. Because, uh, because you know, now listen, this is a big statement, because you know. Do you know? That's why you're in this Bible study. That's why you're listening. That's why we're praying. That's why you meet with other brothers in Christ, so that you can know, right? Because you know, because here we go, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, and this is important, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, there's a lot of buts and ifs in the Bible, guys, relative to our faith and then how we respond to that faith. Now, listen carefully. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. That is the definition of faith. You believe it and you don't doubt it. Do you understand? In um, Mark, tw uh, Mark 9, chapter 9, I think around 29, there was a story about this young boy that was uh, a spirit controlled him. It was throwing him in the fire, tried to drown him, all these things. And the um, apostles, they couldn't heal him. And Jesus came to him and, and, and he said, oh, you of little faith. And he talks to the father and the father says he's doing this. And the father says to him, if you can, would you, will you heal him? And Jesus looked at him and just, he said, if I can, I mean, if I can't, you know, like I'm God, I think I can do it. Now you're at, you know, that's a great way to ask God if you can, that's not it. And, and Jesus said, I, you know, definitely I can. He says, and do you believe that I can? And the man said, yes. And I asked you to do it. And then the man turned, I love this in his humility and honesty, he took the look to Jesus. He said, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. Now think about this for a minute. Where do you get your faith? We talked about this two or three weeks ago. Your faith comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from God. Ephesians 1 and 2 says that we get our faith comes from God. We can't take pride for it. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says Jesus Christ is what? The author and perfecter of our faith. So now if you say to me and you look at this and say, gosh, I don't know, I'm double-minded, I'm worried, and I can't seem to, whenever this happens and you start to feel double-minded and unstable, what do you do? You say, Jesus. You see, how could you do that? Because you're walking with him all the time, because you're yoked with Jesus. If you're yoked with him, he's right there. He's, he's yoked with him. You don't have to go to the Himalayas. You don't have to go to the church. You don't have to go into the chapel. You don't have to do a bunch of, of candles and and incense and things like that. All you have to do, all you have to do is say, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. Jesus, help me not to take that drink. Jesus, help me to stop looking at the girlies. Jesus, help me to go do my job and hang in there and not to, to give up. Jesus, help me to have wisdom. Jesus, let me go in the right jack spot. Jesus, because Jesus is right there with you, okay? I know people that use the name of Jesus Christ. They use two words, and I don't wanna say the other one, okay? They use this word, that if you look at any of the modern thing on TV, that I, I went into this one program. Everybody said, it's a great program. You ought to watch it. So I turned it on, my wife and I, and in the first, uh, I'm going to say the first 400 words, which is not very long, first 400 words, 37 seven of them were the F word. And it was just conversations with families and children and, and husbands and wives and grandmas and grandpas and, and guys out do, playing basketball. It would just constantly. So whoever wrote this on purpose is wants to spit in the face of God. They've got a great program that has a great story and all the other things that are good about it, but they want to say, we can say anything we want. Ephesians chapters five, four and five talks about how we're not to have any kind of corrupt words and things like that come out of our mouths or think or do. And yet, and so we're trying our best to watch a program that's enjoyable. Nancy and I would try to get the line. It looks like, and there's some good things, this and the good things. And constantly you either have a sex scene just thrown in for no reason whatsoever. Just boom, it's there. And then all of a sudden you've got this constantly going on so that the constant battle of everything. And so what do you do if you're yoked with Christ? Lord, help me not to want to watch this. Help me not to do that. Help me to turn from this. Help me, Lord. Help my faith to be real faith, faith in you, not in what I want to do, not in who I am. I, let me, like I told you, Romans 12, one through three, let me just sacrifice that for this because I want to know your good and perfect will for my life. Because here we go. You want wisdom, right? But what would wisdom be? Could you define wisdom if somebody asked you? Let me tell you what wisdom is. Not so you buy the right stock at the right price. That's not wisdom that you went out and bought the right piece of land at the right time, five years ahead of time or 20 years ahead of time. Oh, that guy was so smart. He bought that land before they came in here and they did this and they did that. What's wisdom? Wisdom is to know the will of God. And then, well, hold on, not just to know it, but then to do what? To believe in it and to act upon it. So here it is. What's the will of God? Rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It means that it's God's will for you always to be conscious. Now, listen, 
to be conscious of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Always to be conscious of the fact that you are either yoked with Christ or you're not. And like, again, it, we were saying, Eric, that as we see the end times coming, as we see the end of the world, the end of, the, of, of history coming, and it's coming around us all the time, it's much harder to meet together. It's much harder to be together as Christians, the Christian men, to make an effort to do whatever you got to do, because life becomes way more complicated. And when life becomes way more complicated, then it's more difficult to get here. So you have to decide. Everybody has to decide what they're going to do with their time, what they're going to do in their mind as to what's going to happen. So here it is. Let's say it again. So he says, that person who asks for wisdom from God should not expect to receive anything from God. Such a person is double-minded, unstable in all they do. So there's, I, I come to this. There's, there's no standing firm. There's no joy in the Lord. There's no success in yoking with Christ without what, what you and I would call saving faith. Now, there's all kinds of faith in the world. There, you, you, let's say that I've sat in a chair for a long time, and I know that chair, and it's my chair, and I come home, and I sit in a chair. So when I sit in a chair, quote, unquote, I have faith that chair's not going to you know, break, and I'm going to fall on the ground. That's not saving faith. That's knowledge faith. You understand? That's... You have knowledge, you have learned, you have, you're educated, you, you know about cars, you know about airplanes, you know, or whatever. I'm not a pilot, so I wouldn't have the faith to fly, but people are pilots and they can fly anything. So they have, they walk in and they, quote unquote, they have the faith that they can take this thing and fly it. Well, that's because they have prior knowledge and information and experience, and that information that, that gives them faith, right? The same thing goes on when you and I are talking about people who say they're Christians. They've been around Christian families. They've been around good things. They've had this. They've seen God do this. They've seen God do that. And so they have faith in what? They have faith in their experiences. They have faith in their Christian experiences. Then you have people who are what? This is because this is how the conversation goes. You have people who are Islamic and they have their experience with their family. And those Islamic peoples that are not uh, brutal and they're not out trying to kill people and they have these good experiences around that. And they have that faith and they believe that's the same. And it, it's it's just the same. You have your religion. I have my religion. And we have this experience. And we have our faith. That is not the faith that keeps you from going to hell. That's not saving faith. Saving faith is in Christ and Christ alone. And what he did, because you, guess what? Because you can't do it. Because you come to the end of yourself. Because you acknowledge that I'm double-minded in all I do. I can't do it. I am not able to to do what needs to be done for salvation, and I can't even grasp and understand what that means. Now, what do you do? You go to God, and you yoke with Jesus, and you talk to him, and you walk with him, and you learn about him, and you pray, and you read the word of God, you eat the word of God, you spend time with other Christians, and you envelop yourself with the idea of this yoking with God and yoking with Christ every day. And that's why we have done this thing, the opposite, what's the opposite of today? In today's world, you have this thing called woke, okay? And woke is, is a word that covers a whole bunch of things, but basically this is it. I was uh, talking at lunch yesterday, and he said, what is woke? I, 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 I've heard it, but I have no idea what woke is, okay? Woke is the opposite of anything that the Bible teaches or tells us. I'll say it again, the opposite of the word of God. Because woke doesn't acknowledge God. And without God, the fear of the Lord, understanding that God exists, that we are responsible to God, without that, there is no wisdom. And wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. And that wisdom tells us, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. And he says, that's okay. I love you. I love you more than your sin. And I'm sending Jesus. That's why John 3.16 is so important. God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Jesus turns around and says right there in 17 and 18, he says, I did not come to judge the world. I came to save the world because everybody's messed up and everybody's sinful and there is nobody who's going to get out of here just on what they believe. They're only going to get out of here if they accept 
the fact that they're a sinner and that I personally was the one who died on the cross for them and rose from the dead. And that saving faith is the faith that can withstand, now listen, it can withstand what? What did he say? Many trials? Didn't he say many? He said, let, let me see. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Many kinds. Lots of them. One right after another. Lord, I don't know if I like this Christian stuff. Well, guess what? The trials are going to come to everybody, and you're either going to be what? Built on the sand or built on a rock. And if you're on the rock, then you can come and do what? You, you can trust God. Now watch, because this is what it says here. It says, when you, when you trust God, you no longer are like the sea and the waves going back and forth. Why is that? Because you have a rock. You understand? You have the rock of your salvation. Jesus told the story. The guy built his house on the rock, built his house on the sand. You build your house on the rock. How do you do that? Now, let me just say it again, and I'm going to continue, but here's how it is. How do you build your house on the rock? Here's the deal. You read the Word of God. You study the Word of God. You memorize the Word of God. You come in areas like this. You hear the Word of God preached and teach. You, you come with other believers together, just like we are here. You talk to each other about your lives. You ask each other to pray for your, each other. You yoke with Christ because Christ is in each individual. And that's how we come together on this world. That's what it means. When one or two are gathered together, guess what? He's there. He's together. We're together. When Jesus left, the apostles did what? They came together and they prayed. They came together and studied the word. That's what they did. And in fact, it was so important that when they had all the people show up and all of a sudden they got people all over the place, they said, we can't go out... There's no way we can go out here and feed everybody and go out and do this and go do this. We need to be together and pray. So let's get some guys and let's appoint some people as leaders to go out among the people and do the things that have to be done in the people, right? And that's why we have, you know, we have elders, we have preachers, we have elders, we have people who are generosity, we have people who are administrators. God's given everybody different talents. And that's why we don't look up too high at one or the other. And we're going to hear that in a moment. James is going to tell us, hey, you may look big here in this world, but watch out because it's temporary. And you, and you know what happens with people that are high in this world? What happens to them? And it's, I got to tell you, it's just nature. They become prideful because they think that for some reason they're better than the other guy who's down over here doing this at the bottom. And you, let's read it together. It says, believers, this is verse nine, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position." But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they're going about their business. Why is this happening? It's because eternity. This whole thing is about eternity. What, what James is saying is that when you look at life and the trials, tribulations, whether you're up or down, everything has to be looked through the lens of what? Through eternity, which is our men's group here. This is our thing. And I, I know some of you guys aren't that comfortable with it. But I always say, I was at lunch uh, yesterday. I said, the guy said, well, it's all about Jesus Christ and where you're going to be in 10,000 years. Period. It's, 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 it's eternity. So everything you do, your business, your, your family, playing tennis, you know, golf, surfing, all the stuff you do. Everything's about Jesus, and everything is about where you're going to be in 10,000 years. I was talking about Mike came back, and Mike's a busy guy. I mean, you don't want to know how busy Mike is and all the things he's involved with. But guess what? Everything has to become into that vision and that understanding of eternity. Everything. You know, you look at your little grand, like I got five little granddaughters. I can remember the moment each one of them was born. And I can remember when they were one, two years old. Now they're a little older than that. The youngest one's seven. And I, I went and saw them the other day. She's doing cartwheels all over the place, doing this, that, and running all over. You know, it's, it's like a rubber band, you know, just, just constantly doing this, that, and the other thing. And I'm sitting there looking at these kids and I'm thinking, but it came back in my heart, I said, this is all about Christ. It's all about eternity. And so I started to pray for them. 
we actually pulled up last week's deal and put it on the TV so they could see, you know, how bald I am on TV and the whole thing. And they said, oh, Papa, look at your head. It's shining, you know, because we were watching the uh, YouTube, uh, you know, message from last week. And um, I, I, you have no idea. I mean, you do have an idea. You probably have more of an idea than I do with your family. And that is that you have to keep readjusting your thinking adjusting your thinking. You know, you know what it ends up when you think about eternity, guess what happens? Your pride goes away. You're not quite as angry as you, you know, you don't get so angry. You don't get so difficult and obnoxious. And you, you know, a lot of the stuff about your lifestyle and your personality sort of diminishes greatly when you think about eternity. When you think about that everything is about Jesus Christ and where you're going to be. And then all these things that James talks about. They become real. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, listen, guys, having stood the test, well, what's the test? Think of Proverbs 13, uh, what? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, is, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your own instincts and acknowledge him. And it, here we go again. This is eternity. Acknowledge him in all things and he'll make straight your paths. And what's this, what does the next verse say? Nobody ever says this one. Don't think of yourself more highly than you should. And boy, they don't like the next one. And give right off the top. When the stuff, when your good stuff comes in, be be out there, be a joyful giver. Well, you know, they 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 that verse is real nice, except when you get to the point that don't think of yourself more than you should and start giving away, you know, giving from your riches, you know. Because everybody likes to get that first part. They love the your paths are straight part. Okay. So listen carefully. Let me read it again. As I, I jumped in, it says, having stood the test. So guys, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, and all the way to 10, tells you how to pass the test. Did you hear me? Write it down. Proverbs 3, 5 through 10, tells you how to pass the test. This is that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, what did Jesus say? In uh, John chapter 15, uh, 15, if you love me, what's he say? If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Why? Because it's eternal. Because this is what it means. If you love me, you obey my commands. And he says right here, I'm going to read it again. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I'll give you another verse that's very interesting you want to think about when you think about what it says right here in James. What does it say in Romans 8, 28? One verse that everybody likes to memorize. It says, all things work together for good for those who what? Love the Lord. If you don't love the Lord, all things are not working out for good. Let me say it again. Put it in reverse. All things do not work out for good for those who do not love the Lord. Now let's go further. All things work out together for good for those who love the Lord. And to love the Lord means you do what? You obey him. Now, if you say you're a Christian, but you have a little bit of an issue on the obedience side, which, by the way, everybody seems to have, including myself, and that obedience side, the most critical one that you can mess up on obedience is not gathering together. This is me, not gathering together as brothers in Christ and not being, quote unquote, on the Zoom or reading and studying the Bible or eating and drinking the word of God, which is what we're doing right now. We're eating and drinking the word of God. And that's what it means to be yoked with one. Now, listen what it says. This is verse 16 or verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desire and enticed. Do you understand? Everybody who's sinning is doing it because they want to. Because it comes from their own desires and their own evil desires. That's why God says a person's heart is there's evil in there. So we don't even know how evil our heart is. That's why we say in uh, what I say, I hope you do. And, and David said in Psalm 139, uh, 23, 24, search me, O Lord, and know my heart, know my evil thoughts, and my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's because in our heart, the deepest part of our heart, where our, where the, it, they're jungling, you know, you talk to guys and boy, you get down there in their heart. And I don't want to talk about it, you know, and 
and everything. And, and then there's some guys will have a couple drinks or something. Then all of a sudden that stuff comes out, you know, and, and all this stuff and in our hearts are what? All kinds of anxiety, fear, which then leads to evil, which we have desires that come out and that all sends us out to do what? Sin. That comes from within. And God says what? I want yoke with Jesus. That means open your heart every day, read your Bible, study your Bible, be with other Christians, open your heart, let God take over and you work and walk with Jesus. That's what it means. So 16. Well, let's go uh, verse 15. Then it says, he dragged away uh, 14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, in other words, you got it all figured out. It's in your mind. You've done the video. It gives birth to sin. Now you go actually, and you do it. And sin, when it is full grown, gives what? Birth to death. Leads to death. Death comes. That's what sin is all about. That's what Jesus died on the cross to pay the price so that we don't have to die for eternity for our sins, okay? So, I love this verse 16. This is the verse I pray every morning. This is the verse I think about all the time. I want you to know, this is a verse I think about all the time. In my business and the way my life is and the ministry and ups and downs and the funds and all the issues and problems all over the world and different things going on, I think about this all the time. Now listen to what it says. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Listen carefully, do not be deceived. It doesn't, it's not what it looks like. It's not, it's not those people. It's not those issues. It's not that government issue. It's not this. Don't be deceived by everything you see in the world. That, that ban of spiritual darkness that excludes God. There's no spiritual truth in it. All there is is logic and reasonableness, quote unquote, without God. Don't be deceived. Everyone in this room and everybody hears of this, do not be deceived. Now listen what it says. Do not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change. He's not up and down. He's there consistent. Listen carefully. He does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, through the word of truth, which is Jesus Christ, the living word, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Listen to this. Every good and perfect thing comes from Jehovah Jireh, our God, our loving God, his providential loving hand. He's sovereign. He's in your life. And you need to know that. Do not be deceived. The living word of God is everything to you and I. It's everything. It's how we yoke with Christ. It's how we get the rest in our heart. It's how we don't get all excited and anxious when things go wrong. Because we know that God's there. Don't be deceived. He's there. Every good and perfect thing comes directly from his hand. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Listen carefully. Take note. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. One of the biggest problems we have is we respond with words and anger, when we see all the things, whatever's going on, something we don't like, and all we don't do is we don't listen, and we say, God, we say, okay, Lord, I'm yoking with you. I love you. You want me to be gracious. You want not to be overreactive. You want me to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Lord, how can I give thanks in this circumstance? How can I deal with this? And all of a sudden, you know how you can, because you're talking to Jesus because you're talking to God, because you're hooked up with all power. You have all the power in the world with you. You can overcome everything, every time, all the time. Just a tiny little faith in Jesus, yoked with Christ. You can handle it, death. They're coming in, they're walking in the door, they're laying everybody out, and they're gonna cut their head off. And that's happening, it's happening, it's horrible. It's there, and, and even in that moment, nothing can separate you. Nothing, Jesus says. He says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God, not even the sword. And people used to read that. I'd read that 
20, 30 years ago, and I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, nothing separating from sword. Now, if, if you happen to live in Afghanistan or if they have any coverage in Afghanistan and you know what's going on and the horrible, the horrible decisions were made, all the terrible things that are being done, we understand that this world is coming to an end and it's rapidly coming. And, but we don't have to be afraid. We just have to be aware. Did you hear me? We don't have to be afraid. We have to be aware. We have to have wisdom. And wisdom means to yoke with Christ. So let me read this. Do not merely, now listen carefully, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after that looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He doesn't do a thing about it. And what's that called? What is the mirror? The mirror is what? It's the word of God. I, he comes to Bible study. He goes to church. He learns the word of God. And he turns around and goes out like a fool, meaning there's no God. A fool says in his heart, there's no God. So he learns all the Bible. He studies the Bible. He knows the Bible verses. Uh, Eric and I were talking about a friend of his that he knows all the stuff. He does all the stuff. He looks all good. And then he goes out and does what? Does whatever he wants. He sleeps with somebody else's wife. He does something stupid. He cheats on something. He he doesn't do his taxes right. He he's in a deal and he and he doesn't tell the truth. So, you know, he says, "Well, that's, I didn't need to tell him that. You know, that'll blow the deal." You tell him that. I found in my life, I've been so free. I remember when I was a young guy. I had nothing going, no place, and I was really poor. I had not much, not as changed. And I'm going along, and and I can't tell you how often this happens. There'll be something that I know is really not that pertinent it's not that big of a deal but if if you tell it to certain types of people and their personality types that'll just blow everything up and, and then lord always puts on his head and you know what i do first thing i do i gotta tell you first thing i do is i call him on the phone i say hey you know what i want you to know about this this is important this is something about this deal and this is this or somebody said this or they said that and they're thinking and this is what i think is going on and this is how it works and I have never seen it blow that. I've never seen it blow. I've never seen a blow deal. You know why? Because those people, they listen, they understand. They begin to feel comfortable with understanding. Then we get into the weeds and a deal. We get all the information and then we get it done. And then we either do the deal or don't do the deal. And everybody feels good. And guess what? Nobody's coming after you, trying to find you saying, if that's what Christians are like, I don't want anything to do with them. Yeah. I, I, there are no, there are no Christian cars. Listen carefully. This is really an important one. There's no Christian cars. All those little stickers. There, there are no Christian cars. I know that's hard to believe, but there are no Christian cars. And, and this is going to really get you. There are no Christian companies. That, that's a biggie. There, I'm going to say it again. There are no Christian companies. And then here's the biggie that we've already found out in the, in the hardest, rudest way. There are no Christian countries. Do you understand that? There are no Christian political organizations. You know, there's only Christian people. You either know Christ or you don't know Christ. It's not whether your grandmother knew Christ, your mother and mommy knew Christ, your daddy was a great Christian. Doesn't matter whether all your grandkids truly know the Lord. And your wife knows the Lord and loves you right up to the, your last breath. And it doesn't matter whether you went to church every day of your life and gave all your money and did all that. But unless you're yoking with Christ, unless you trust him with saving faith that he, for everything, he is sovereign. He's your God. And don't be, just don't be messed up with the world. And when you're rocking around like a ping pong ball in the ocean, grab a hold of the rock, hunker down on the rock and take the rock. And but, Well, I can't find the rock. Why? because you didn't go to Bible study, because you didn't read the Bible, because you didn't pray each morning, because you don't have a clue where's the rock. Where's the rock? Where's the rock? The rock's where you ignored it. So when you and I get a prayer, and we're about ready to finish here, and I want to read this and think about it, think about this for a minute. What is your life about? Who, what are you thinking about? Are you misled? You know, what did he say? He says, don't let people, you know, don't get misled. Now watch what he says here at the end. Verse, uh, verse 25. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, which is the word of God, and gives that gives freedom, that is the law of Christ, the gospel, continues in it. Did you, you don't just look at it, say you believe it, but you continue in it. It's a lifestyle. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Which brings us to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the council of wicked, stand away the sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Have you ever thought about what that means? Stand in the, the council of this world, all the darkness, it's a spiritual darkness without Christ. So they don't walk in that wisdom. Do you understand that? They walk in the wisdom of God. They don't walk in that wisdom. They don't stand in the way of sinners, meaning they don't stand there. I, I've been there, standing there. And, it, and it's a nice thing that comes together. Just the people stand there, and all of a sudden, somebody has a drink, and somebody starts talking. We're standing there, and all of a sudden, everything's fine. Everything's going okay. Everything's fine. We're talking about the deal. Interest rates, what do you think? You know, Don, how long do you think the absorption would take? And what do you think about the cap rate when we're done? And, you know, we're going on and on. We're talking about oh, and the lenders coming into town. I need you to be there. And we'll talk about it. All of a sudden, guys start, yeah, did you just see someone? Did you see that? You know, start talking about a girl, a lady. Just one time. You see that. And then, boy, and then the guy starts talking about, and then he's running a movie in his mind. But instead of keeping it in his mind, he starts mouthing this movie off. Okay? So now he's starring. He's got the star. He's got her and him. They're starring in the movie. And now he's doing the dialogue. Standing in the way of sinners. Let's have another drink. Standing. and Let's tell a dirty joke. Let's talk about this deal. Let's, let's do something wrong. Now, all of a sudden, we went from thinking about that to, well, maybe we've got a deal. And, hey, maybe if we do this, we can get into this and do that. Do not stand with the sinners. When they start going south, and you know, if you're studying the Bible and you're reading and praying every morning and you're studying and memorizing the word of God, you know when they start to go south, you don't have to judge them. I always say, hey, guys, I've been praying about this deal. Oh, by the way, they love it that I pray for the deals we're working on. I said, I've been praying for this deal and I'm a Christian and I can't stand here. I'm not going there. I'll see you guys. I'm out of here. That's all I say. And I go. Now, some of the guys, you know, they say some pretty bad things about me They'll, as I leave. But then the next day after they haven't been drinking for a while and everything, and they look at me as a, I'm going to do something that's going to help them. Everything's back. It's cool. But guess what? I'm not going to stand with the sinners. And I know many guys who have, and it's ruined them. Do you understand that? Just one more drink ruined them. And I'm going to say it again. One more drink ruined them. Because they didn't stand up and walk away. All right? Sit in the seat of mockers. Have you ever turned on the TV and looked at sitcoms? Everything on TV is dialed in to be a mocker. They're mocking everybody. But now who do they mock the most? God. And then Christians. And now they're starting to go off after Jewish people. And that shows, that is the key ingredient to show you this is the end of times. This is it. It's coming. It's coming. And I say it's coming. I mean, I think the rapture's coming. And I want to be ready. It says, be ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Have you read the word of God and looked at it like, and not like a fool, but you looked at it and you went out and you did it and you're doing it. And you're not going to sit in the seat of mockers. You're not going to sit there. I'm sitting there sometimes after playing golf or whatever, and we're at the table, and all of a sudden, somebody, the conversation is fine, and all of a sudden, somebody starts mocking this and mocking that and mocking a person that is happened to be not there to pr protect themselves, and they're mocking and going, and I'm out of there. I, hey, oh, I got to go. I got to go. I, I'm, I'm, I got a Bible study uh, tomorrow, and I got I to gotta read my Bible and study and pray and get ready for it. <laughs> oh, they're just, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, you know, how could you even say those things? I don't, and I don't want to be around that guy, play golf with a guy like that. You know, I'm not. Sit in the seat of mockers, stand in the way of sinners, take advice from the world. How about, how, you see those commercials where they got that little green line and people are walking on, if you do this, you do that, and you do that. In 40 years, you're just going to have all the money in the world. Everything's going to be fine. And then you're going to die and go to hell. Oh, they don't put that part in. They just have the perfect line. You follow that and everything's fine financially, right? So which way are you going to go? What's your plan? What's your investment plan? I love that. What's your investment plan? All my equity is in heaven right now. 
What do you mean? I'm, I'm getting my uh, house, um, what do you call it? Refinanced. <laughs> well, where's the this? Where's your reserves? Where's the debt? Uh, in heaven. I, I'm a really wealthy guy. Uh, yeah, but, uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little example. You want to know where it's coming? Look at my tax returns for the last 45 years and divide by 45 and see if I qualify. Well, we can't do that. I said, why not? Because that shows that God has provided for me for 45 years. If you don't like that, just do the last three years. Let's get, just do it, divide by three. Can't do that. Why can't you? See, the world doesn't work like that. The world doesn't think like that, okay? They give money to people who don't need money. Do you understand? But they won't. It, it's, that's how it works. You're not going to, I'm not bound. You can't bow down. I can't bow down to the world system. We have to do what? We have to trust God. The, the other day, and I'll tell you, this is very exciting. Um, for a long time, I was having a hard time being able to give a certain amount or do this and the other thing. And all of a sudden, I made a couple of deals. And Nancy, I told you this last week. I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. We got to write some checks. I mean, to the ministry, you know, and everything. And, and takes it. I just was so excited. I was a joyful giver. And I was just rejoicing, telling the Lord. And, and when I talked to my wife, I brought it up. And she said, yes, she was excited. Now, that's pretty cool. When your wife and you are not, you know, maybe, maybe not, whatever. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So what God says is, look, read it. And then what does he tell you to do? Oh, my gosh, look at this. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. If you're not going to talk about it, if you're not going to turn away from what the dialogue of the spiritual darkness is and talk about the reality of the spiritual light that comes down from God, the, the truth, the vertical truth, that's what you need to be talking about, right? That's what you need to be sharing. And listen to this. Religion that, the, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's it. In other words, that's what it's all about. What did, what did Psalm 1 say? Keep yourself from being polluted from the world. Psalm 1. And blessed is the man who meditates on the word of God day and night. He's like a tree planted by, by the living waters. And he produces, his leaf never withers. And he produces fruit in season. I like he said the in season. In other words, he produces fruit in season. When God wants you to produce the fruit, the fruit will be there. But your leaf is not going to wither. Guys, we're closing now. But isn't James 1 just wonderful? It really is. It gives us a perspective of what it means to yoke with Christ. Next week, we're going to do 1 Peter chapter 4. It's going to help us in the same way. And I pray that we'll be here and we'll pray about it. So, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the hope we have, Jesus, through your death and your resurrection, that you paid the price for our sin on the cross, and then you rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives. You made us born-again children of living God. Our name is written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.